so uh, let me introduce the last topic of this uh, for this event, sort of round table that we are all distributed. So uh, what I want to talk about is like the last step that probably the step that takes you like 50% of the time when you are creating a, a model, uh, take into account that I'm not, uh, so okay, this is about simulation, but it's not only simulation because what I'm explaining now could be also applied to a GIS model or just some statistical analysis. Okay, so the idea, here is that if you think about how do we test our model again or evaluate our models, I think it's, it's a more neutral way against the data. When you have some data and a model to test, in the end what you are doing is you, your model is a hypothesis of some explanation. Uh, it's, it's an explanation of something that is happening. And then what you do is that you try to see if this explanation makes sense. Okay? We usually use, or the common frame in science is a new hypothesis significance testing. It means that this your hypothesis or your set of hypotheses or models, then you have a new model that mm, probably, or usually it's something like the pattern I, I observe in the, in the data was generated by a random process. What you do is you quantify the probability that this new hypothesis generated the, the, uh, the pattern. And if it's less than a p-value, let's say 5%, then you, you reject this new hypothesis. And the corollary is that then you accept your hypothesis as the uh, better explanation. This, this problem has two, th two requirements for, for being uh, OK. One of them uh, is that it should be, I mean, the list of hypotheses must be complete. It means that there's no, another, there's no another explanation beyond the null hypothesis and your hypothesis or your list of hypotheses. And the second one is that they should be mutually exclusive. If one is correct, the other ones are wrong. OK, we have a problem here. Uh, because this was created for uh, laboratory analysis or, or things where you can really control everything. This is clearly not the case for social behavior, and especially it's not the case in archaeology with all the uncertainty we have. So as uh, Dr. Solbu said, uh, it seems that it's not really what we should be doing, right? So um, the first challenge here is like if we want to get rid of this uh, framework, statistical framework, it's not really what we need. We should get another framework, obviously. And uh, one thing that we could do is, what if we just get rid of the null hypothesis and we start comparing hypotheses or models or simulations, one against the other ones? And what we want to know is which one fa fits better the data we have. So which explanation is better for what we have? How can we do this? Uh, imagine that you have two models, two simulations. One of them, imagine, I don't know, an equation-based model and an Asian-based model. How do you compare them? There are two things that you should take into account. One is, uh, imagine one has two parameters and fits decently of the data. The other one is way more detailed. It has five parameters, but it has a better fit to the data. So I don't know. Uh, we can open discussion uh, afterwards. Which one would you choose as the better explanation? So it's not, that, it's not that simple, because in the end, you need some method to quantify two different concepts. One is the goodness of fits, and the other one is parsimony. Goodness of fit mean how good is my model. So it's mainly uh, computing the distance between the data and the outcomes of your model. Before that, you need to, uh, let's say, uh, fit your model to the data. And then so uh, you use the parameters. You see that it's getting the best response. And then you can sort of quantify this distance. The other one, it's uh, used, uh, sometimes it's ignored, but it's essential. It's how simple is my model, OK? Uh, parsimony, you can also call it Occam Fraser. And mainly the, the thing is that there's a problem because if you have a lot of parameters, you can fit very well your data, but then your model is very complex. Or as von Neumann would say, uh, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant. With five, I can uh, make him weak as his trunk. <laughs> this is a, a very big problem because then, OK, you can create a model with 100 parameters, and then it will fit perfectly. I, I won't go into what means uh, fit perfectly your data. But in any case, uh, what if you have a model that is not that good, but only has two parameters? So um, this, this, this uh, problem is not only on archaeology, of course. Um, it's mainly in all historical science, meaning history, archaeology, uh, biology, which is also historical science, because we have a lot of fragmented data, and we have some kind of temporal dynamic, such a temporal dynamic that we want to understand. And there are a lot of the new tools. I mean, it's sort of a revolution in statistical framework right now, and it's exploding, because there's a huge discussion about what methods are better if they can replace the statistical uh, frequencies, frameworks, etc. So you have, for example, the most common ones that are the information criteria measures, that what they are doing is quantifying the loss of information from the outcome of your model to the data. 
So if you take a look at the data instead, or, sorry, to the outcome instead of the data, how many information are you losing? The second one, it's based on statistics that has been around for like 300 years, but they had a slight problem that, um, let's say that uh, uh, apart from very simple models, you could not really apply this statistics because of computational requirements. This has disappeared now, so we should be should be using this uh, beyond, let's say, C14 data, and it's the only thing that is using based statistics. So uh, this is the second uh, thing. The third one, I uh, think, is the, the most uh, popular right now. It's okay. Based statistics cannot be really applied to simulation. For uh, I won't go into details, but because you cannot have what's called a Lagrangian like function of an agent-based model. So there's a method of approaching a Bayesian computation that was created in population genetics and now is uh, available and everybody can use it. It's quite simple to get it. But mainly it can allow you to apply Bayesian statistics to simulation, okay? So all these methods are part of, all, th all these tools are now uh, there for us. And um, the question is, uh, should we use it? Shall we replace the new hypothesis approach when we are talking about simulation? So I'll leave you with these three random thoughts I had, and I think that they, they can be useful for opening the discussion to the room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think between the two models you propose, uh, the one who explains 70% with five parameters is more, is more correct than the second one because it's more robust. Mm -hmm. There's more robusticity. If you make a linear regression with only two, two values, yeah. you will have a good coefficient of determination. But it's not uh, if you if you take one, your model is collapsed. So the, mm -hmm. you, you, you talk about the goodness of fit, yep. parsimony. But uh, what about uh, robusticity? Uh, I think it's more or less parsimony. So parsimony is like if you have less assumptions, it's better. And in some ways, the same. If you think of Bayesian statistics, um, OK, you can have two parameters. But if one parameter, let's say, uh, the parameter is quite wide and has a very, let's say, the response of varying this parameter is quite sensitive, then it's not that robust. And then it, it's, it's, I think it's more complex than saying this one is better. I think that you should apply one of these methods, because then uh, you should uh, you are really integrating both things, uh, let's say, not a priori, but as a result of some kind of, uh, of a mathematical device that is built for that. Well, I'm not agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So there's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a place to disagree. I think, you know, a lot of people will, you know, have to be something that I'm not completely sure if it has said in archaeology, but I suppose that you can use CVR. Uh, Based reasoning, case based reasoning to make models and to modify the models on the fly. But I'm not sure if it has sense in archaeology. Mm, I'm well, like you, Chavi, in computer science. So you can make a model, yeah. the, the output could be compared, and then you change it and make a feedback at the end okay. in order to adjust the parameters. This is mainly, in some ways, what these statistics do, where you update uh, your prior, so, okay, you have, let's say, your information, your prior knowledge, and then you adjust this prior knowledge in base of your model plus the experience. So when you get more evidence, you can rerun your model and improve your, uh, let's say, your uh, model, meaning the model, not only the behavior, but also the parameters that you use. Because so, you have a data set of the solutions. Sorry? Because you have a data set of the solutions, then you can compare. Yeah, but so for example, in archaeology, lots of times you get more data after doing something like, I don't know, if there is excavation going. Right. Uh, the cool thing is that you can introduce this new data without uh, going from scratch. So what you can do is like, OK, let's uh, take the data, the knowledge I have, and everything, and then rerun the model. And, 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 and so on. let's cool it, you do not change the model. Exactly. Right. Okay, so we already had a problem of how do we pick up the data we're going to validate against it. Now here's a problem, we cannot use simple stats. <laughs> Damn you, Shabby! <laughs> they are, I mean, conceptually, they just have this, for yeah. example, they are simpler. The thing is that, on reality, they are, they are yeah, more complex. Yeah, 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 let's face it. Okay, are there any people actually using Bayesian to analyze the results? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you are. We use it in our lab. Okay, we use it in our lab for a lot of the population-based stuff. Okay, there's a question there. Uh, no, then just, uh, I want to add a little comment on this, uh, why the best statistics of C14 data. This is uh, not quite true, at least I use it for special analysis of the data. 
and also extracting some views from Bayesian statistics. Um, we can use them, uh, they may correspond to a certain to a quite complex behavior of uh, presence, uh, I mean, uh, incorporation of rare data in bigger, uh, which occur in bigger regions, which may have, uh, be, uh, in the end, in archaeological interpretation, they may turn out to be more important than the main body of data. Uh, in this way, it's a good way to incorporate uh, this rare or uh, scare data in, around in the periphery of our it is good that, I mean, to know that there's people beyond C14 is using it. I think that it will be a trend that will increase on time, but right now it's very limited beyond. I mean, I'm not saying it's the only thing because ABC has been published, uh, there are quite a lot of papers right now on evolutionary archaeology of this. It's not a strictly Bayesian statistics, but it's, let's say, the, the same philosophical principle, and, and uh, yeah, they are they are there. So so it's, it's good to know that GIS also is people using it. I'm using it for my base classifiers for something that mm. I think I think it generally picks up in science is just everyone's like oh really we really have to do it yeah. and they're like we know we should but it's so much more difficult <laughs> yeah it's uh, doing the right thing is always more difficult than the <laughs> sadly <laughs> right guys this was their last presentation and I'm gonna just wrap up now so the idea of the round table was to I think, personally, for me, the, it was to counterbalance the situations when people say, oh, you know what, I have this really cool idea. Why don't we build an agent-based model up for it? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great first step, but I feel like people underestimate how difficult this process is and how many holes there are you can fall into. And I still would argue that there are certain questions and there are certain problems that for which it is the only tool. So you have to do it no matter how difficult it is. But it's not a simple case of sitting down for a week, binding a code, and then publishing it a week later. It's actually as long of a research process as for any other tool, be it stats or, or GIS or, you know, or even just like, even just any pretty standard archaeological field work and, and, and material classification. And I felt like it would be good to bring all those problems on the surface so that we are not just the special interest group, it's not just you know, preaching about everyone should simulation, use simulations, but also points out that it's not that simple and that there are problems. And you know, even between the modelers, archaeological modelers, and now I know I have to specify, um, we disagree on certain things. And, and yeah, just like Caesar said, Modeling is a, is a massive field, it's, it's, it's a, and simulation is a gigantic scientific technique that is almost as common as statistics or mathematics, which means that you know, there are very, a lot of flavors to it, but also a lot of methodological and uh, epistemological issues, and it's good to be aware of them, but that doesn't mean you just say, well, you know, there's a problem and validation is difficult, we shouldn't do it at all. I mean, it's still better than writing an essay. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, and if anyone would like to produce any final questions and comments, now's the time. If I may continue from Colin's last comments, like this is a very important thing I think you said. Like there are not many papers anymore in CIAs about GIS, how people use GIS. I was about to just you know, give an example of predictive modeling, for instance. Like, it was a big topic, like how many varieties we had to use, like everybody was so excited about the predictive modeling and things like this. And now you look at the schedule and there are not many predictive modeling papers anymore. And they just changed the name to post-predictive, I think. Like this is almost the same thing, I think. Like this is a personal opinion. So these are personal things that we can, of course, like argue on these things too. Like, it is important, I think, like whenever a new emergent topic pops up, like the agent-based modeling in this case, so there will be a time this agent-based modeling will also somehow die, quote unquote, and diluted in the general domain of archaeology. But this is a pretty important issue here, I think. Like we are not the only archaeologists in the world. Like there is a huge group of people outside which will give the same criticism again and again. I think we lost that train to merge the gap between, if you want to say, processualist and post-processualist approaches. Like the same reactions are coming to the agent-based modeling 
in the same way it was coming to critical modeling. So like how are we going to respond to such kind of criticism that we are more productive in the way that we use our tools? Like this is the first thing that I want to underline. And the second thing is, again, keeping up with the same predictive modeling example, like that was a, a side effect of the modernist state approach. Like the state is going somewhere, building lots of constructions, we have to do something. Oh guys, we have to predict the modeling, let's save the archaeology. And we started to talk about predictive modeling. Like to me, of course it might be wrong, this observation. Now this is the time of Facebook, the Twitter, that like, we are connected together. All of a sudden the agent based modeling is on the table. So we are not really causing, we are the effect of what is happening outside to us. So we are reacting to the outside domain. So how are we going to shape the outside world is also an important thing to ask ourselves as an archaeologist. Like it's, 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 we, have, we have power, like we have to use it, like we have to empower ourselves too. And then I will try to join uh, in the discussion with the, I don't know his name, but he was constantly emphasizing the, the importance of the theory, like the, like the cultural historical approach and like the Marxist approach and things like this. Like, I feel like, again, we are kind of losing again the train of like talking about those archaeological theories. We are so much focusing on the model, like how are we going to code efficiently, like what are the best ways to do like these models so it is representing the most. But like in Philip's example, for instance, if you don't define surplus properly, the whole agent based model that you are going to use is not meaningless, of course it is helpful, but it is, give, it is going to give you something else. But in order to define a surplus properly, what it means in terms of possible economy, we need those archaeological theories. Like the moment that we distance ourselves from the archaeological theory, then we are lost in the mm -hmm. modeling world, then we are isolated back again, which is the mistake. It was done before, and I'm afraid we are going to do the same mistake again. So last year in Siena, I did a little picture on the on the whiteboard there, and I feel like doing it again, but there's no whiteboard. In the philosophy of science, sometimes people compare how we do science as a three-legged stool. And there are legs coming out of the stool, and one leg is the empirical data. In some disciplines, it's mostly experiments. In other disciplines, like ours, it's just basically collecting that data of what is out there. There's another leg, which is the theory. You know, how do we... What are our theories about how things work? There is theoretical physics, there, is, there are social theories, we have theories in archaeology. And the third leg that stops the, stops the, the stool from wobbling is the modeling, because it combines the two. It takes the theories and test them against empirical data. And there is no way you can do either of them without the other two. I just feel the two, the empirical leg in archaeology is so long that we're basically balancing on, a, on one thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's the theory that kind of sticks out, half of which nobody actually understands what's going on, and the other half, even though there are very solid things there. Everyone kind of has, and everyone has some kind of theory, you know, they, they, are, they follow some kind of theory, one way or another, even if they admit they don't. Um, and then the modeling could just start stabilize this, this, this tool, and then basically those three legs have to kind of grow in unison. There's, you cannot do well either of them or the other two. So I wouldn't say we should give up on field work, and I wouldn't say we should give up on, on theoretical archaeology, they're all part of the same scientific process. But I feel like the modeling lag is so short that until we make it longer, it will be very difficult. We'll just wiggle on the on the on the stall on the, those two legs. The thing you've got to worry about is that it's not Pinocchio's nose. Hmm. Please for all. Loader. You've got to worry about it not being Pinocchio's nose. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like we're basically wig wiggling on a Pinocchio nose of empirical data at the moment, mostly. <laughs> you know the big three keys in all disciplines, theory, technique, and technology. So my way of problem is that we have discussed a lot about technology, thinking that all theoretical and technical things are with technology, but of course technology is not a solution. Technology is the bike we, we use maybe to express the solution, if we have the solution, or maybe to find the solution. Then theory in archaeology, we are very much involved on that. Uh, we have plenty of different theories, plenty of different explanations with 
more or less environmental determinism with more or less social determinism, everything. The main question is how to translate theoretical ideas in which language we express theoretical ideas and to connect the technology. Because we need this third point, this is technique. And that is what we are, we, we have not yet began to discuss. Maybe, and maybe this for me is utopia, is can we create a library of uh, social concepts expressed in technological language? If we say, well, why not surplus? Why not to use an, the library of surplus definitions using different senses of surplus? Bavarian economics, uh, Bohemian sociology, Marxist economics. Maybe this is the solution for ecology. Up to now, we have been uh, too much determined by verbal language. And anything is possible within verbal language. But we are now beginning to think that fast everything is possible with the appropriate technology. So maybe we are not solving anything. And we are translating all the knowledge we have from 2,000 years of archaeology into technology. So we have to, to think on that. Yeah. It's a question of language. It's a question of formalization. But it's a question of discussion altogether. And for one moment, it's possible that the explanatory concepts be the sense, the sense of the concept. Well, isn't that what ontologists like Charles Sierra are trying to do? Sorry? I mean, you, the issue you're raising that we should try to express archaeological concepts in, the, in a more technical fashion, uh, isn't that what ontologists are trying to do? Like Sierra Sierra? Yes, but all of the word of ontology. Yeah. The etymological origins of ontology know, are right? within the subjective realm. So, Maybe we should look for another concept. Well, for me, it's far better library. Okay, the library of concepts. Then, within the library of concepts, you can have different concepts, but differentiated. Then I can use surplus in a sense, and another teacher will use surplus in another sense, and we have different labels and different definitions. If not, the problem is that we are using the same word, but we are have different meanings for the same word. I, I want to point out that the step in creating uh, a simulation when you decide what is an agent, what goes into the simulation, what processes will be will be simulated, is called creating an ontology. And so in the modeling world, we are aware that we are creating a new ontology. We're creating definitions of the concepts such as surplus in the model. It is quite surprising we haven't been used been using the tools, the ontologies that are already developed for archaeology. Not at all. <laughs> yes! I mean, you know. But when, when you deal with ontology, or whatever, you need definitions of what are the things. Mm. So, first of all, we need an agreement of, I don't know, what an animal is, what green yeah. is, or whatever. Otherwise, the models are completely different. But why don't you come to my place for us with chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's what my paper is. Yeah. So, in a way, simulation, the formalization of the system, yeah. which is the construction of the ontology, is where we say, okay, so by an agent, I mean an individual who has those characteristics. They may have age, sex, and wealth. And we don't, don't say, you know, all the, that the human is kind of, the sense of human is in those three characteristics. We just say, in this place, we define a human, an individual, by those three things. So, and that's, that's how we create this ontology. Um, so it is just one of the steps. And it's a very, it's a tricky step in the sense that other people will disagree and say, oh, you cannot, you cannot possibly say that a yeah, human being yeah, is only those three things. But in object oriented, you say, okay, these three attributes are the main ones that everybody has. Yeah. But okay, if I work with a population in, in Africa, I have another attribute yeah. which complements the third one. Sure, if that's needed for your model, you can that's your definition, the basic one. and that's cool. So for say my models, which are very often very simple, that there are, there aren't many characteristics in more complex models. You know, there, you there is more the description, and that's why you know, as as Juan said, um, you know, we use <coughs> words in a different meaning. However, in the code, those meanings are actually very well defined. I mean, you, you can disagree with them, that's fine. I can give you my code and you can change them and rerun it, that's fine. I have no problems with that. In order to disagree. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. And we, I think we all know that all models are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but they can be still be as well. Fine. Bill, you wanted to no. say something? Okay. No, no? All models no, are wrong, and mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to riff on the fact that, that um, more of a comment than anything that building such a model, building an ontology and doing a parameter sweep of the space you've defined yourself is entirely congruous with the post-processual mandate to, to explore alternative mm -hmm. histories and, and things like that. Um, people like Marcus Ubera have written extensively mm -hmm. on this. That's my only observation, yeah. really. I also feel, in a way, simulations may help with, you know, putting a lot of the archaeological theories into more concrete terms and allowing us to actually critique them in a meaningful way because you finally have to say what you actually mean in what you said. And I feel like that will kill some of the theories very quickly and that will take the good theories where they should be, which is at the heart of our discipline. I hope. And I think at this very cheerful conclusion, <laughs> when I had my final kick at theoretical archaeology, <laughs> uh, we will conclude. I would just like to say that during the coffee break, if you uh, would like to talk about the special interest group, we will gather in the coffee area. So